all for being here this evening. We have a um, bit of an update in history on our wastewater treatment facility. Um, I'm going to actually invite up uh, Michael Curry and Jeff Mercer from uh, Wright Pierce to speak a bit about the history and the project. Um, they have a presentation for us tonight. Um, so council members, I ask that you just like hold questions till they get through the presentation. Uh, write things down if you need to, you know, uh, write them down so you remember. And then um, when we get to the end, I'm sure they will be more than uh, willing and welcome to answer our questions, okay? So without further ado, I'll invite them up. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Just make sure that mic is on. There should be a green button or green light. Can you hear me? Yeah, there we go. Great, perfect. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank everyone for inviting Wright Pierce in today to talk a little bit about your wastewater treatment facility and your current and future challenges down at the plant. Uh, the catalyst for this presentation really was a discussion we had about a month ago um, with Bob, Scott, and myself, and Jeff uh, about where we're currently at um, and where we're potentially going to be in five years. Um, and there was some discussion of not everybody has the same history uh, we're not all on the same level playing field in terms of what's gone on since 2016, since Wright Pierce has been involved. So this is a perfect time to have a phase two project update, which is the current project that's under design, uh, and also talk a little bit about the history, and then also continue on with a capacity discussion of what your current capacity is at the wastewater treatment facility. So a quick presentation overview. I'm gonna start with just some introductions with Jeff and myself. We'll then continue on for, to describe uh, the wastewater treatment facility history dating back to its origin in 1970. We'll then talk a little bit about the current phased project summary approach with the, which the city is currently in. And finally, we'll wrap up with a capacity review of your wastewater treatment facility. So I'm Mike Curry. I'm the New Hampshire Wastewater Group Leader at Wright Pierce, based out of the Portsmouth office right down the road. Uh, my, my focus at, wastewater, at, at Wright Pierce has really been vertical wastewater treatment facility design. Um, and really what I've been lucky enough to focus on is treatment facilities within the Great Bay. So my focus has been wastewater treatment facilities that are trying to overcome a total nitrogen treatment issue. And I have Jeff Mercer behind me who's going to speak at the next slide. Jeff has really been the driver for the, the projects in Summersworth. He's been part of the, the phase one project since its design all the way through managing the construction efforts. And he's currently the project manager for the phase two design, which is underway. Jeff? Thanks, Mike. All right. So I figured it made a lot of sense to really just start from the beginning here and talk a little bit about the facility, give a, a background of where things start and where we are today. So the plant was originally constructed in the 70s as part of the Clean Water Act. It really didn't experience much, experience much of a change until 2003 with a dewatering upgrade. And soon after, they went through the first major facility upgrade with the upgrade one. Um, the driver behind that project was in addition to the NEPTI's discharge permit which is the regulatory driver behind a lot of the uh, upgrades that we're going to be talking about today as well. Um, that permit addition was total phosphorus. So some of you may or may not be familiar with phosphorus, but it's typically a limiting nutrient in freshwater uh, water systems. So by adding that as a limit, it tries to uh, help prevent some of the algal blooms and other issues. Then we fast forward to 2016 uh, with it. Wright Pierce got involved. Um, the city had some concerns over the future of the plant um, and how it relates to growth in the city um, and whether or not the wastewater facility can manage some of that growth moving forward. So in 2016, we did some process modeling to do a capacity evaluation of the facility. And one background piece of information that's kind of important to, to point out here and really was part of the driver on these concerns of the capacity was, so what we're looking at here is two aeration trains. Now the aeration trains are really where a bulk of the treatment of that pollutant load is being treated. Um, 
think of it as kind of big vats of of microorganisms that are doing a lot of the work removing that uh, pollution. Um, the problem was back in 2016 is that due to various needs for repairs, the city was only able to operate one train, just train one. So this train was actually empty prior to the uh, phase one upgrades. Um, with that train offline, the city was at about a 96% of its capacity um, and kind of the metric that we typically use is biochemical oxygen demand and that's really the demand imparted on uh, on the receiving water for reducing those pollutants and you know taking oxygen out of that receiving water so um, part of part of the findings for the capacity evaluation was actually that a significant part of the influent loading was industrial waste. Um, so there were some discussions in the evaluation about how to manage the industrial loading in addition to needing to bring that second train online to kind of recapture some of that capacity that the city wasn't able to take advantage of. So following the capacity evaluation, was the wastewater facilities plan. And that is really where uh, some of these phase, we're gonna talk a lot about phase one, phase two, phase three. Those are just a series of projects that were outlined originally in the facilities plan on how the city can best manage the, facility, uh, the wastewater facility when considering kind of the, the next 20 years of growth in the plan. So a uh, facilities plan is really probably the most important document for a wastewater facility. It looks at current trends in the collection system and a lot of the pollution, pollutant loading, but it also takes a look at what plans there are for the future. Um, certainly it's taking a look at a crystal ball and trying to figure out, well, how's the population increasing or what do we have for major plans for industrial commercial growth? So it's trying to predict that um, and taking that information and projecting a design flows and loads so that we can better plan the future of the wastewater facility. So I mentioned before that the approach that the city opted to take was a phased approach. That was basically taking all the recommendations in that facility plan, both from an asset renewal aspect, you know, replacing stuff that's failing or is requiring a lot of maintenance, but also looking at how can we better protect the community um, as things change, both in growth or regulatory drivers. So came up with a phase one project that's taking everything that was already failed or creating a lot of maintenance, um, things that really needed to be taken care of for uh, bringing that first train online, which of course was the primary driver. The phase two project, that was, which is the one we're currently talking about now or in design, that one was more of a asset renewal capital improvement project. I think a good way to think of it is this phase project is almost like automobile maintenance. So your phase one project, you've got a flat tire. It's, your plant's not really operating like it should. It needs some immediate attention. So we replace the tire. Well, phase two project is more looking at those regular maintenance, your wear items, replacing the brakes, wipers, et cetera. So then when we look at the phase three project, we've taken care of everything that's really a, a critical concern. And now we're like, all right, what can we do to better protect us in the future? Do we need to assess, do we need to do like a comprehensive rebuild on the car? Or should we get a new car, et cetera? It's kind of looking at those things for the future. So let's take a look at phase one project. That's one that's already been complete. So this one was completed in 2021. Remember, it's, it's high priority items, things that needed to get the aeration train back online, back at full capacity. So we actually took these aerial photos after the phase one project, but if you look at satellite images from before, this tank was barren. Uh, it had some duckweed in it from rainwater, but all that was available was this train. So following phase one, we've got both trains online. That was the main goal of that one. But we also looked at some maintenance needs and 
they added a third clarifier here, which helped with some capacity. And then we also accommodated some building code requirements, but primarily is getting that train online and recapturing some of that capacity that wasn't available. All right, so today, phase two, we're currently in design. So this one is simply a capital improvement project, an asset renewal. We're looking at things that a facility plan was really a medium priority. You know, we knew down the line it was going to be a need, you know, because this was a plan that was set in place in 2017. Um, it was a plan for 20 years into the future. So we knew by the time phase two was going to be ready to be constructed, there are certain pieces of equipment that were going to need to be replaced. So that is really just touching a majority of the equipment that was not touched in the phase one project. We're trying to basically make a clean slate for the facility. Um, that is currently in design now um, with a tentative construction date of 2025. Now we're talking about phase three. So that's kind of our, it's a more of a complex project. That's really looking at the future and what can we do? What can we invest in to better set up the city for the next 10 plus years? Requires a little bit of pred prediction on how things are gonna look. Um, so on the facility plan, the kind of the outline that was proposed was we knew that nitrogen nitrogen limit was going to be coming. Um, so the facility already had phosphorus limit. Well, the facility plan, there wasn't really a, there's ammonia limit, but there was not a total nitrogen limit. Um, for those that may not be familiar, and I'll, I'll get into it a little bit more later, but uh, nitrogen's similar to phosphorus being a limited, limiting nutrient in fresh water. Nitrogen is a limiting nutrient in estuaries and, and uh, saltwater like the Great Bay. So that is kind of like a major focus of the phase three and part of the facility planning was we knew a nitrogen limit was coming. Um, so this phase project was trying to do a little bit of prediction on what those permits are going to look like the Great Bay, but also potentially any changes to the phosphorus limit and maybe other limits as well. Um, the other part of the project is the city's had some concerns over capacity in the past. Well, how can we best uh, accommodate the needs for the growing city? Um, and that's kind of what phase three is looking at is how can we expand the capabilities of the wastewater plant? Because as everyone knows, the best wastewater plant is one you don't even really know exists. So you don't want that to be a issue for growth in the city. Uh, right now, it's really just this phase three project is just in a planning level based on the work that was done in the facilities plan. Um, I will talk a little bit more about what that might look like um, based on some of the permit drivers. So I, I mentioned the Great Bay Total Nitrogen General Permit. Um, that was, that's been decades in, in um, the works. Uh, it was finally implemented in 2020 it's really targeting nitrogen reduction in the Great Bay because that's a limiting nutrient, um, similar to with uh, phosphorus creating algal growths in um, freshwater. There's concerns over um, the quality in the, the Great Bay. So really what the, and it, the general permit is kind of a unique one in that it's, of course, targeting the point source, which was your wastewater facility discharge. But it also had some provisions in there for non-point sources, stormwater, which is also a fairly large contributor of nitrogen to the Great Bay. Um, specifically for the city, that limit is 92 pounds per day. It is a seasonal limit, active April through October. Um, it's a five-year permit cycle. So what that means is coming up next year, the permit will expire. And with that expiration, there's a potential for uh, revisions to be made. And at this point, you know, it's, it's just a guessing game as to what that might mean. So in addition to the, the general permit, which covers a bunch of communities, the city also has an individual NEPTES permit. Now this covers all the other effluent limitations, including the phosphorus, which we talked about before. Um, the 
the one interesting thing is that any day now we're actually expecting the city to receive a medium general permit, which will replace this individual uh, NETDES permit. Um, but it, it'll probably be similar in terms of some of the uh, effluent requirements. All right, so with our three phases in mind uh, and understanding that the phase two project is simply more of an asset management and preparation for the phase three, which would be our true capacity upgrade, uh, we wanted to take a few slides to just kind of look at how the plant is performing now in relation to some of the facility planning projections and uh, what the capacity is at the plant. So if you recall, phase one project wasn't complete at the time that the facilities plan was developed. So there's potentially some changes in how the plant is performing. So I'll look at that in a little bit, but um, yeah, so phase one, we rebuilt that second aeration train, huge part of the capacity consideration, and then expanded a little bit with the clarifier. So if we take a look, at how the plant is actually performing. Let's see. So 2016, this is our facility planning area uh, time frame uh, pre phase one. So, phase one, single train online. These are your capacity numbers. I think the main pieces to look at is your flow. That's your flow capacity of 1.7 million gallons per day. And your biochemical oxygen demand. And that's, that was the capacity at that time. So bring that second train online, we gained some flow capacity in addition to the clarifier, and we recaptured some of our BOD capacity. So for those that were around pre-phase one, there was a pretty major concern with this number here. Um, and you can kind of see, I've got some graphs coming up. This number is pretty close to what the plant's actually seeing. So that was a very real concern at that time. But luckily, we were able to grab some breathing room So we look at 2024 with our current flows. You can see we're right at what that capacity was pre-phase one. So pretty good timing on getting that taken care of. Um, BOD has actually come down a little bit, or uh, is actually uh, has remained pretty steady, which we'll see in some graphs here. But um, again, very close to what that pre-phase one capacity. But we've got some breathing room here. These are all averages. And then the facility plan just had some values that I included here for reference on, based on some input we had from the city on what potentially may be the values in 2042, which was the design year. Okay. So what we're seeing here is a monthly average for BOD values. Um, I'm going all the way back to 2012. So our facility plan is basically in this range. That's how we developed our projections all the way to 2042. Um, at that time, TSS was eh, pr pretty steady. BOD was, was overall pretty flat. Uh, since then, it's, BOD has stayed, again, pretty steady and flat all the way through 2023. TSS has a slight increase. That's not as much of a concern for capacity, so to speak. Typically, you want to look at BOD. Um, the thing you're noticing here is we've got some pretty strong spikes. Um, this is during construction where we had some um, moving around of tank volumes and other issues. So that's what's attributed there. But a lot of these other spikes are likely the result of industrial loading. Domestic wastewater is pretty consistent. So based on those, and yeah, here's some more of a, a discussion on that. Based on what we were seeing in that chart, Industrial loading still remains pretty, a pretty significant factor in the capacity of the plant. Um, you know, residential or domestic waste is typically not as influential as industrial, which is fairly concentrated. So in terms of looking at the capacity, BOD and TSS, not a, a huge concern at this time. But when we take a look at total nitrogen, that is it could be somewhat concerning, um, especially with the renewal coming up. I mentioned before that the Great Bay General Permit, that really targeted 13 facilities in New Hampshire. Um, 
Summer's worth limit of 92 pounds is really based on a concentration of eight milligrams per liter. And if we go back to the capacity evaluation, that eight milligrams per liter is about what we projected in our process modeling. Um, so that's to say that the facility is pretty much operating how the modeling shows. Um, and I've got some charts to show this as well. But as I mentioned earlier, the permit is expiring next year. So with that, there's, there's some uncertainty on what EPA may do with that uh, permit, especially where this is the first cycle for renewal since it was in place in, in 2020. So I mentioned that eight milligrams per liter, which is this dash line, that's about what we expect based on process modeling. And you can see based on the past year or so, the facility is operating right where it's expected. So you know, Jamie's doing a good job of keeping those numbers where they should be. But when we take a look at the permit limit, you can see it starts to creep above what that limit is based on the average. Um, now, when you go back and look at the data, this is primarily not a concentration, which is how well the process performs. It's actually a function of how much flow. And we were taking a look at some of the data, and there's actually quite a bit of infiltration inflow. And it's more of a function of how EPA set up the permit you almost get penalized for higher flows. So that's one thing that is concerning when we're talking about um, the nitrogen capacity. So as I mentioned, the process is, is consistently performing how we modeled it. Um, but as wastewater flows increase, that concentration stays the same. Your loading, which is a function of the concentration and the flow, is going to increase. Um, Ultimately, the current and even the future nitrogen permit modifications could limit growth within the sewer shed. Uh, this, the, the solution to that, which is discussed as part of the phase three project, is adding additional volume in those secondary aeration tanks, um, essentially adding a third aeration train to give us more volume which also have the added benefit of adding more BOD and TSS capacity. Um, that said, we really don't know what direction EPA is going to go. They could keep the limit the same. They could lower the nitrogen limit. Uh, but ultimately, the nitrogen is going to be a concern for uh, the performance of the system. So I'm going to take a break and let Mike finish up the... Sure. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, so again, a quick summary and recommendations moving forward from here, and then we're going to go right after this into questions. There's a lot here, so I hope you have some questions. Um, quick summary, current growth is within the city is in line with the facility plan projections. You're not currently growing beyond the BOD or TSS loading capacity of your wastewater treatment facility. Uh, the phase one project, uh, that capacity revitalization, gaining that capacity back within your current tankage, that's been completed, designed and constructed, and currently the phase two project, which is equipment asset renewal. Again, it's changing your brakes, changing your windshield wipers, things like that from a car perspective. That's currently in design. Uh, from a total nitrogen perspective, as Jeff mentioned with that general permit, it's currently being maximized from a treatment process perspective within the existing tankage. It's really being pushed as far as it can possibly go. And the BOD and TSS loading capacity, again, is within your treatment capacity, but it does tend to be highly variable. That'll lead to some of the recommendations in the future. And overall, typical residential growth that you would see in a, a community like Summersworth is allowable as long as your industrial loading is moderated and as long as we get confirmation with NHDES that they are in approval with whatever that connection permit is going to be moving forward. 
Uh, some recommendations to consider moving forward. Uh, we recommend, this is in the facilities plan as well, that you continue to review your industrial pretreatment program, whether that's a local limit study, industrial surcharge, overall compliance. Um, that heavy industrial use within town will always be one of the most significant impacts to your wastewater treatment facility. So that needs to be closely monitored. monitored. Continue monitoring for the total nitrogen general permit and what the status is of that moving forward. Uh, I made a joke earlier um, before this that if I could have a, a graphic of a figure of a, 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 an eight ball, uh, a magic eight ball to figure out what the future was going to be, I'd like to have it on this slide because nobody knows right now. And that general permit again expires at the end of 2025. So that will be, that will be a little bit of a point where the city can make some decision if EPA decides to make this more of a stringent total nitrogen general permit. But it could go either way. Nobody knows at this point. So just continue to monitor that. Keep, keep uh, going into the meetings, the Great Bay meetings, and, and keeping your ear to the ground to make sure you know what's going on. And again, phase three is dependent upon those potential permit revisions, specifically total nitrogen. That's going to be what dictates what happens in phase three. And finally, start early to identify funding considerations for phase three. I can't uh, be vocal enough about this. If phase three doesn't happen for 15 years, that's great. But you need to plan as if it's potentially going to start from a, a planning and design perspective at the end of 2025. That's your safest bet. And one recommendation which isn't on here, uh, which we can actually add to the final copy we can give to the city is uh, continue to look at your inflow and infiltration. I know the city went forward with an inflow and infiltration analysis within your sewer system. One of the things that works against you as a treatment facility, as Jeff had mentioned, is the fact that when you have storms and you have wet weather in the spring and in the fall, your wastewater treatment flows go up whether it's groundwater or storm leaders or things of that nature. And when that happens, your total nitrogen loading goes up at your wastewater treatment facility. So the more you can take that water out of your sewer system, the more capacity you have from a total nitrogen perspective in your treatment plant. So that's something to absolutely continue to consider. And really what you look at from that perspective is, is where's your heavy hitters? Where's the, the big sections where I have a lot of II, a lot of leakage within my sewer system? So with that said, I'd like to wrap up pretty close on time. I hope we didn't go too, too far over. Um, we'd like to field any questions that you may have. Yeah, great, thank you. Questions from council. We have, I see two over there. First, Council Gibson, and then Council Parity Catanzaro. What Can you turn your mic on, please, Councilor Gibson? Thank you. Are there, you're adding the phosphorus to the system or it comes through the actual sewage? The phosphorus as well as the total nitrogen, it's part of the sewage. It, it just, everything flows right to the plant. Okay. Um, I know this is probably outside your expertise, but is anybody looking at alternatives because I assume nitrogen and phosphorus are primarily fertilizer related. So phosphorus, um, they both can be fertilizer related. You're absolutely right. In, in different parts of the country, it's much more related to those. Um, whereas we're not as heavy of an agricultural area in, the, in New Hampshire right here, it's not quite as much of the problem. A lot of the nitrogen actually comes from our urine. Um, that's one of the biggest sources of nitrogen, ammonia right, NH3. So that gets converted to nitrate and then to, or nitrate to nitrate. That's the, the concern from a total nitrogen perspective. Phosphorus oftentimes uh, is from detergents, soaps that we use in our dishwasher, on our bodies, in our hair. Um, they contain phosphates. So that's one of the big portions there. Um, we were talking a little bit before about how that Great Bay permit has two sides. It has the wastewater treatment facility side, and then it has what we call the non-point source side, which is stormwater. That's where those agricultural sources, they're trying to control those. Um, and they're doing everything they can to, I don't know if you've seen it, places where they say, uh, they'll have signs up that say, pick up your dog waste. That's one of the reasons why because dog waste is, you know, they found it to be uh, a significant source of, of phosphorus and nitrogen to the Great Bay. 
Okay. And just for information for myself, because I'll admit I'm ignorant on this subject, um, when you brought the second train online, um, you only got a marginal increase in processing capacity. Mm -hmm. um, just wondering why doubling the trains, that's all you picked up. Mm -hmm. Jeff, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Um, so actually, once we added that second train online, one of the limiting components ended up being both the process and the settling capacity in the clarifiers. So if you could use the microphone, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, my apologies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Signal. <laughs> so that was a great question. Um, so when when you're looking at the second train being brought online, you are increasing your volume, so you think you'd get um, double the capacity. But part of what that was also is the settling capacity on the clarifiers. So we added a third clarifier, but we didn't necessarily double that volume, so to speak. So that ends up being the limiting factor in the equation. So in a sense, you're sending solids out of that secondary clarifier um, the clarifiers are, I mean, not the clarifiers, from the aeration trains, you have to settle those solids out before they go to the river. Um, so that ends up being a limiting factor in that case. But it's a great question. Thank you. And the other thing I'd like to make note of is that uh, this can't be stressed enough. In 2016, uh, Summers Earth was operating, you know, 96 plus percent of the capacity. It was like on the very, very edge of violating. Um, it was kind of a miracle that it wasn't violating, to be honest. So when that additional train is added, we have a degree of conservatism that we have to put into those designs. So it should be because we don't always have a, a Jamie who's operating our treatment facilities. We have to make sure that if Jamie goes somewhere else, that the next person that comes down in line, they can also operate it. So there's a degree of conservatism in there where I wouldn't say that that treatment plant couldn't necessarily do more with two trains, but on paper we have to say, hey, here's, here's what it is. Design and safety factor. That's right, absolutely. Councillor Perry Canzero. Yes, thank you. Um, great presentation. I learned a lot. Um, I had two questions. One was about the total nitrogen. So that second slide with the green dots, where um, looks like page 24 on my PDF. Um, I understand that the volume or the flow level is higher. So even though we're still at the percentage rate that essentially the um, permit was created for. It looks like we're over the volume. So is it correct to say that keeping everything as it is right now, we even if the EPA comes back and says we're not changing anything, we still would need to make some upgrades. Is that true? Yeah, there's the potential for that to, to exist. So the original permit was developed, uh, that 92 pounds per day was developed using data from 2012 to 2016. So they looked at all the treatment plants across the Great Bay and they took that data and they said, here's the flow, the average flow condition that we're going to use and we're going to apply a concentration to get a mass limit. Now the problem with that is that we all know in this room, there's different years in terms of rain. Rain is one of the biggest indicators of how much I and I you get. So if that 2012 to 2016 time frame was not as wet as say 2022, 2023, which is exactly what you're seeing right here, then you're going to violate. It's, okay. it's just the nature of how they wrote the permit. Um, now I would say there's a, a reason why there's been violations, which those are, and you haven't had a phone call. EPA knows that. They understand that they've written a permit that is, is almost impossible seasonally to meet every single season. Um, but they're, again, they're, they're trying to set the stage for what potentially may come in the future. But your point is a, a valid one where if we can't continue to optimize this treatment process even further, there may be a condition where that permit doesn't change at all and you still have to do a, a, an upgrade to, to get to another level from a total nitrogen perspective. Or, and this is why I wanted to stress the point in the summary and recommendations, the other alternative, and maybe it's a combination of these two, is to attack your inflow and infiltration and, and look at that II study, which I, I believe was completed last year, and say, here's where we want to invest some of the funds that maybe we would divert this way and attack a couple sewer basins to try to reduce 
those monthly average flows to the treatment facility. So the, um, if they update it using the same concentration, the total capacity might change because they'll be using more recent years to do that average or? Do you mean for the, the next permit iteration? Yeah, you know, in a, in a hypothetical where the next permit, they keep, you know, that whatever that eight per liter number was Milligrams instead of the 92 liter. number. Yeah. If they keep that eight number the same, mm -hmm. but they use more recent years, 92 is going to go up. It potentially could. If, if it's been over that average number of years, it was a higher average flow than it was in the previous subset. The difficult part about that is, is that it's, from EPA's perspective, I think they are unlikely to provide a less stringent right. permit limit. Yeah. So they would, even if the numbers worked out that way, they more than likely would look at it and say, we're going to find another way to, to do this. Yeah. Um, my second question is around the stormwater. Um, I thought, and I obviously could be very wrong, but I had thought, I know that we have other mitigating things for stormwater, different um, ways that we divert stormwater than just going through the wastewater treatment facility. So how could you explain a little bit about how more stormwater and groundwater equals more flow going into the treatment facility? So um, I guess I, I would divide it into a couple different categories of what we're going to call stormwater here. There's uh, from the Great Bay General Permit perspective, there's traditional stormwater like we see outside with our catch basins. Um, if you're using tree filters or swales, um, those catch basins typically lead out to the river, right? There might be a little bit of retention somewhere, but they typically go right to the river if things are working well. Um, so that's what we would call traditional stormwater infrastructure. Now, what I was speaking about that goes to the wastewater treatment facility, that's uh, what we call inflow and infiltration. That's stormwater that we do not intend to go to the wastewater treatment facility, but ends up making its way there. It's also groundwater too. So uh, in that instance, it could be things like maybe City Hall has, uh, you know, this. I don't know how old this building is, but when this building was first constructed, more than likely everything went to one place and it all went right out to the river without being treated. And when they started to build the infrastructure out, they tried to disconnect those as much as they could, but they didn't get everything. So inflow and infiltration is comprised of things like storm leaders in old buildings that potentially lead right to your sewer. Um, another option that can potentially be inflow and infiltration is groundwater. So you have sewer pipes all over your town. Some are in higher elevations, some are in lower elevations. Some of them are brand new plastic pipes. Some of them are old vitrified clay pipe. Some of that old pipe um, and even some of the new pipe can have issues in terms of cracks or at a manhole it can have issues with it in terms of leaking right at the manhole connection. And when you have high groundwater that comes above where that pipe is, you have groundwater that's going directly into your wastewater system. So that's what we call inflow and infiltration. It's really, it's a separate thing than stormwater. Um, there's some overlap in some ways, but the inflow and infiltration is one of the main things uh, that I would say communities have to deal with concurrently with these nutrient removal upgrades because it's becoming more and more costly per gallon to treat our wastewater. Um, and from a regulation perspective, it's, it's sort of what EPA wants, right? They want communities to make sure that they're only sending wastewater to their wastewater treatment plant and then they're, they're not wasting capacity at that wastewater treatment plant with things that really shouldn't be there. Got it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Great. Other counselors? Councillor Goodman. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> great presentation. Thank you uh, for putting it together and walking us through it. Uh, a couple clarification questions just because I'm uh, getting myself caught, caught up to speed here. When you're saying EPA, we we're talking federal EPA, not NHDES. That's correct. Okay, so this is a federal permit. This is a, a federal permit. Uh, New Hampshire is uh, what they call a non-delegated state. So EPA Region 1 writes the permits for communities in New Hampshire. That's different in different states. Some states actually have their own regulatory body. Right. But yes, it's EPA, Got federal it. agency, <coughs> writing the permits for this. Got it. So it, uh, no, NHDS has nothing to do with it. We just get passed straight from whatever happens at the federal level through that division comes directly down to our permit. So uh, and it, I wouldn't say they don't have anything to do with it. They provide uh, their recommendations 
and they're they're doing their best job to to be honest um, from what I can observe they're doing their best job in the Great Bay to try to hold back EPA and say hey we need to help these communities along we need to go at a slower pace mm -hmm. um, so they are still they are still involved they oftentimes will say this is what we recommend for a permit limit EPA will review that and then decide it's more or less stringent than they want great um, and my next question is really more about um, assessing growth and future capacity. Um, you know, t I guess I don't under know what typical residential growth means. Mm -hmm. Like how many, you know, I, I know I've asked this question to staff before, um, but just trying to get our head around and like numerically, like how many units is that per year? Like what is the upward limit of, of our growth as a community from a residential perspective? understanding that there are obviously other variables that go into it, such as managing our industrial flow. Um, so that's part one of the question, sort of just from a residential growth perspective, you know, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. And then I'd also like to hear a little bit more about, you know, the local on um, industrial pretreatment program, just understanding how that might look specifically in a community like ours, or if there are good examples of communities that have implemented good practices on that that we might look to um, as we begin to think about um, trying to bring uh, that up to up to snuff to uh, enable more capacity. Sure. All right. So for the the first discussion, I guess I maybe I should I should stop using the word typical because it's not really typical to any community. Um, like it's very much community dependent um, in terms of if a community is really trying to push development in a certain area, if they're close to a city, if there's nearby um, industry that's being added. For Summersworth's perspective, I would, I would uh, assume typical is probably between 1 and 2 percent of what your current wastewater flow is um, per year. That's kind of the, the upper limit of what I would assume to be typical. So I'm really basing it on a wastewater perspective, and I do that because uh, not all developments are created equal, right? A, a condo that has um, three bedroom units that you know you're gonna have full of families, that's a very different wastewater flow projection than single bedroom condominiums. Um, so uh, from a city's perspective, I would say this is something you need to make sure you're being aware of from a planning perspective is when you are approached with a development um, that we keep a, a close eye on that and make sure we have a good understanding of how much wastewater it is and we can we can help assist with here's what the projection would be here's what the additional load to your wastewater treatment facility is and look at that and overlap does that answer your question in terms of typical um, yeah let me just restate it so I make sure I understand it so you, you, and rather than putting it in terms of units you're saying in terms of our percent base flow that we currently have typical growth is one to two percent of our current volume that's correct okay yep uh, and then we could back into you know any mix of potential uh, unit types or types of housing yep. from there absolutely okay yes thank you I yeah. yes yeah. yes yep Yeah, I believe we did a sort of a back of the envelope calculation and there wasn't a concern with that from a BOD TSS loading perspective. The caveat I would have on that is that currently you're in violation of your, your nitrogen permit. And in order to, I would say, be above board, I would make sure that we pull in NHDES to say, hey, here's what we're proposing. We're currently optimizing for our total nitrogen treatment. Um, we're continuing to get better and better. This is a new process to the city. Um, and and make sure that they are they're on board with uh, with that moving forward. Great. Other questions, unless Councilor Goodwin, you still have some. Yes. Yeah. Um, is your mic on, uh, Manager Belmar? Okay. Is your mic on? <laughs> <laughs> We're all doing it. Uh, the pretreatment uh, program that some communities have, as well as the surcharge program some communi communities have. Yeah, so the thing with industrial pretreatment programs is. Sorry, not to cut you off, but I did. Um, we, we do compliance, and um, Jamie does a great job in regards to compliance and getting people 
back into compliance when they're out of compliance. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, th the cool thing about industrial pretreatment programs is they're pretty much all unique to the community because every community's got different industrial users. So from my perspective, it's kind of a fun thing to look at. Um, we did look at that a little bit in the facilities plan, and I think we actually gave an update on, provided an updated memo back a couple of years ago as well. Um, for the city, that would probably have to look at maybe updating the sewer use ordinance to put in potentially local limits um, for BOD and TSS. So some communities have limits on their BOD and TSS discharges, typically well above what a, a domestic uh, load would be. And kind of the goal of that is to try and drop down that industrial load to be closer to a dom domestic thing, because really it's easier to treat a uh, wastewater at its source than it is once it gets mixed in with everything else. Um, the other thing is with the surcharge, the city does have a surcharge on BOD and I think TSS. Basically that's just charging users a certain amount over whatever the, the surcharge limit is. Um, and we looked at that, I think, back during the capacity evaluation or maybe after that, um, and found that Summersworth's was actually pretty low compared to other neighboring communities. Um, so that is probably the easiest approach is to kind of target, maybe looking to update that to bring it into more standard uh, or current times. And, an easy way to do that is just take a survey of other communities as well, just give them a call and figure out what they're charging for those. Um, but yeah, I mean, so, but then the surcharge program is the easy part, but the local limit usually takes a little bit more work because you've got to do a survey of all the industrial users, figure out what they're discharging, and then you got to take all that data, bring it back to the plant, figure out what the plant has for uh, limitations and fact check that. So. Councilor Goodwin, are you all set? Well, Mike, you want to add something else? I would, I would add um, the sort of similar to what Jeff said in the beginning about industry being different from community to community. The way that those communities approach it is also very different. So when it comes down to this, our wastewater is more and more expensive to treat. And the decision that has to be made is how do we want to pay for that? There's a bunch of different ways that you can do that, right? Some do it on the tax base. Some do it on the individual user rate. Some do it on a combination of user rate and industrial surcharge rates. So the, the, the real evaluation I think that needs to occur is at, at the beginning is how do we want to divide this cost? And like Jeff said, from an industrial perspective, there's a lot of ways that we could do that. That in, like industry within town, they can decide, or, or your city, they can decide that um, or the ta city could decide, we want you to treat it at the source so that we don't have to pay to treat it and have to have the capacity at the plant. That's one option. Um, typically what ends up happening is there's a combination of a few, right? Because that industry prov provides a significant value to the city. We don't want to shortfall that. Um, so there's typically some sort of, t you know, push and pull that happens before you find out where that happy medium is. and. Right now, I think that the total nitrogen component of this is probably the biggest driver uh, to dictate where your decision will have to go in terms of how the rates are going to be set, whether it's how the surcharge is going to be set or if it goes to the general user rates themselves. Um, so there's a, a lot of different ways that it can happen. It's a kind of a complicated both technical issue and a political one as well. Okay. Councilor Goodwin, are you all set with questions? No, but I think um, we'll we'll leave it there for now. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, other questions from council? Councilor Witham. Thank you. Apologies for being late. Um, doing a little bit of catch up here, but I love this conversation and where it's going. Uh, I know a number of years ago now, and I don't remember how many we had a conversation about uh, our rates for industry and all of that. You're correct. We rely solely, almost solely, here in the city on. Uh, the, the end user, the, the rate that we charge them based upon uh, water volume consumed, right? Uh, yeah, we have bedroom hookups. I guess that's another revenue source when we have new development. Uh, but by and large, the burden is bared by uh, the end user. Um, 
when we had the conversation around industrial pretreatment and surcharges for industry and those sorts of things, you're exactly right. It became more of a political conversation than a financial one because every community in the state is competing for those same industries because we value what they bring in terms of the tax base, right? Mm -hmm. And there's the bigger, I guess, conversation about our tax structure here in the state. Our tax structure impacts things like wastewater, right? Because we're competing for these industries that uh, maybe otherwise you might not compete for the mm -hmm. same. And I think we're seeing that now as well with residential uses, right? Whether we're, we're talking Elm Street or the proposal by Chinberg down here on Main Street, there is a need for housing. We All of us collectively would agree there's a need for housing, but there is an impact to that. And how does that impact at our plant get paid for Typically, it's by the end user, or uh, certainly in the case of larger development, uh, the per bedroom cost that we're going to have up front, that little bit of surcharge that can help us with some of these modifications. So, you know, oftentimes developers look to waive that because it's expensive, mm -hmm. right? Uh, when you're talking hundreds of units, but there's a reason it exists. So, I think we need to be careful as a, as a political body, right? So, there's where the politics gets involved, right? There are these competing interests, and I'm not sure one is better than the other, but they certainly uh, exist. Yeah, and they have to coexist. Uh, it's it's a good question that's been brought up a, a, amongst a lot of communities right now with looking at are they charging impact fees for connection or are they charging system development charges? What are those charges? Oftentimes communities have just kept them at what they were 30 years ago. It's $1,000 per hookup. Um, now that original fee was in place because it was supposed to be reflective of the cost <coughs> of the buy-in to that piece of infrastructure. But now when you think about this, we've gone through phase one, we're about to go through phase two, we may have to go through phase three. This piece of infrastructure is no longer a thousand dollar buy-in. It's much more significant to buy in. Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's the tough balance with this, right? You're looking at places that say, do we wanna connect with the sewer or do I wanna build my own septic system? Yeah, we had that with another development as well, uh, and they ended up connecting. Mm -hmm. um, the, the last point I'd make, I appreciate you saying maybe we need to eliminate the term typical from our lexicon. That's true of industry as well, right? Not every industry is the same. You know, uh, I look here in the community, and I don't know this factually, but I'm guessing uh, an operation like a, a general linen that launders lots of product, uses lots of water, uh, and has a higher demand on our system uh, than uh, uh, perhaps another user that has, you know, like a Walmart that has some restrooms and, you know, it's, it's relatively benign, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So not all are the same. Right. So. And the, the big piece, especially now that we have total nitrogen in play here, it's flow and concentration. It's not just flow. Not all wastewater is created equal. That's the purpose of a surcharge fee, is that the wastewater that you're sending us is not the same that we get from... Jeff and Mike flushing their toilets at home. So that's what that is supposed to reflect. Thank this you. Is oh, go ahead. I'm yeah, sorry, you're I'm just good. kind of go ahead. lingering on here. Uh, this is perhaps a better question for our, our city staff, but uh, do we have a list of our big users of wastewater in terms of yes. both flow and of nitrogen? That list is available. That would be helpful to see, I think. Thank you. Thank you. All right, further questions? We have City Manager Belmore, then Councillor Austin, then Councillor Gibson. Yeah, you mentioned we did some improvements in regards to code, meeting code, current code. We also keep an eye, just uh, as a matter of information to the public and to the council, keep an eye on efficiency. We changed the VFDs. Could you speak to that? And actually, a couple of years back, we received an award from New Hampshire DES presented by Congressman Pappas in regards to uh, our ability to be efficient as far as electrical use and that sort of thing. So that's a good point. So part of that project, um, I believe the city ended up getting around $100,000 in uh, rebate or grant money back from, uh, I, I don't know, the organization is probably part of uh, uh, Eversource funding, but uh, most of that was from VFD replacement, so it allows equipment that may have been operating at 100% of its electrical load all the time. Instead, it's able to reduce its speed, reduce its electrical demand based on what it actually needs to produce. 
Um, part of our process upgrades is we changed. So part of the uh, secondary treatment tanks, you remember those tanks, um, we have to keep those, everything in there in suspension, mix it up. So prior to the phase one upgrade, there was a bunch of mechanical mixers. Not only were they kind of a, a nuisance for maintenance, but they were also pretty inefficient. So we changed how that process works with a, a large bubble system. Um, and that actually reduced how much uh, electrical demand was needed for that secondary process. So that was actually another big piece of that project. So it wasn't just um, replacing equipment that was broken with what was already there. We also took a look at um, improving the efficiency at the same time. And, and Jamie's always been a pretty big stickler on trying to operate everything to uh, as efficient as possible. Um, and as part of that, the city had conducted an energy audit prior to that upgrade. So we incorporate some of those recommendations as well. So good question, yeah. Thank you. Councilor Austin. Thank you. Thanks for your presentation. I appreciate that. So I, I guess what I'm hearing from all the discussion is that the status quo is, is not satisfactory. We have to continue to plan and move forward. So my question really is a hypothetical, uh, and there probably is no one single answer here, but if, let's say we're 20 years down the road, and Let me just make sure I ask this as simply as possible. If, if we use the existing infrastructure at our plant and continue to add on and do things to it, can we ever get to an efficiency point with our existing plant that we would have if we built an entirely new wastewater treatment plant with current technology and all the bells and whistles that go along with it? Would that be a more economical way to go in the long run than trying to continue to upgrade, repair, fix our current facility? It's, it's a really hard question um, because there's a, a, a lot of different options, again, depending on this magic eight ball of where our total nitrogen limit ends. What I will say is that communities across the U.S. are challenged with upgrading existing infrastructure to meet new NIPTES limits. And with that said, technologies are developed to work within existing tanks or within ex the infrastructure of an existing site in order to make it work. Um, there's a whole slew of technologies that are much more compact uh, that the city does not utilize right now that you could look at in the future. So I would not say that it's you're at a point where you would move your wastewater treatment facility. Um, I think the site itself, while it is tight, there's space to do what we can within that existing space. You may need to add tankage. Um, like Jeff showed on that phase three, there's some space on the roadside. Um, but I don't think it's you're at a point where it's advantageous or economical to, to relocate that, especially considering all of your sewers, all of your pump stations lead to that one spot. That's one of the hardest discussions to have is wherever that's relocated, you're now pumping all of that water to another spot, mm -hmm. which is really, really difficult. So I think your, your site itself is fine and the technologies are there. Uh, we just need to figure out where your target is, what target you have to hit um, at the end of 2025 when this happens. Thank you. Thanks. Councillor Gibson. Um, lastly, uh, referring to uh, wastewater and or groundwater, um, I don't know again if this is in your sphere, but does it make sense to consider limiting the amount of blacktop going down in communities? Because that means that basically you increase your runoff because there's fewer places for uh, rainwater. To go. I think it's, uh, it's an important consideration when you look at the second part of that Great Bay Total Nitrogen General Permit. And a, a lot of that permit, what it does, um, EPA is essentially trying to give communities an off-ramp to say, if you do more work on the stormwater side, so if you put in things like rain gardens or stormwater treatment facilities, um, that they'll, they'll give you a nitrogen credit on your point source at your wastewater treatment facility. However, in general, uh, 
communities have found that it's much more effective from a cost standpoint to do it at the wastewater treatment plant because it's one location. Um, but back to your question, it's something every time you add blacktop, you're right, it, it exacerbates a problem from a runoff perspective. I wouldn't say it's necessarily you have to put a, a stop to any blacktop going down, but when it is going down, I think um, use of best management practices is important. You need to look at it and say, all right, where is this going to impact around? Do we need to make sure that we're you know, enforcing a higher degree of stormwater treatment or retention? Um, so better designs is really what we need when we're looking at blacktop, because for so long it was just, just put it down, you know, we'll, it'll go off to the ditch on the side and it'll go wherever. Uh, and those days are over. Um, we really need to be more cognizant about what's actually happening to stormwater. How can we treat it? Can we store it? Bioretention basins. I mean, UNH has an entire stormwater center that's devoted to this, this science exactly. Um, so it's, it's something I would say we need to put more of an eye towards and be more cautious about how we allow it and what we allow. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. All right. We have a few other questions. We have Councillor Perdy Catanzaro and Councillor Witham. Thank you. Um, so just wondering about timeline. You said that we won't know what the new, if it is new and updated, uh, nitrogen permit is going to be till the end of 2025. If we're in design now for phase two, right, um, at what point do we need to make a decision informed by that? Do, can we wait until it comes out? Are there things that we're going to need to decide in the next year, year and a half before that comes out where we're going to have to play that crystal ball thinking? Um, what's the timeline there? Uh, it's, it's really, uh, it's up to Summersworth. Um, you, can, you can decide that you wait, um, which from, if you're going to ask my personal opinion, I, I think I would take and I would recommend the wait and see. Again, we don't know what that target looks like right now. And if your upgrade goes from a 92 pound per day total nitrogen plant to a 60 or a 50 or a 30, those are different upgrades. Those are drastically different upgrades. So I have a hard time saying right now uh, to tell you to go to the most stringent upgrade. Um, if the city wanted to proceed in that direction, you could. Um, but there's, there's sort of an interim measure here where I think we have to wait for it. Uh, and, and like we looked at right here, you know, currently there's, there's violations which are occurring. Uh, I don't believe that EPA is going to act on those currently. Um, but I, I think the most prudent approach, both sort of fiscally and from a, a design perspective, is to wait. Wait, keep listening keep understanding how EPA's arguments are being crafted and where this is generally headed, and that will help inform our decision moving forward. The manager has an answer as well. Yeah, I got a little confused. Right now we're design uh, phase two. That's correct. Oh, we did I say phase two? I meant phase three. Yeah, so we, we, we shouldn't del delay phase two because that's upgrading our assets end of life um, equipment and so forth. That's correct. Phase well, we, 2 has nothing to do. The delay is phase 3. Yes, the delay is is any sort of action on what phase 3 looks like. We knew that phase 1 and phase 2 were going to happen sequentially regardless of what the permit was. It did not matter. Those two things needed to happen to regain capacity and to make sure that you had a reliable operable treatment plant. Phase 3 is the one where right now we we just don't know. Um, and I, I think it makes sense for us to keep listening. Um, and, and plan accordingly. I have a quick follow up on that too. Um, for the first uh, implementation of the EPA's restrictions, did they allow a, you know, sort of uh, grace period for municipalities to uh, meet their goals? So to kind of follow up on that, say we get our answer in the, you know, the end of 2025 um, and it says, okay, we need to do this, how much time as a city would we have to be able to adjust and build or do what we need to do to be able to meet that new restriction? It's a really good question. Um, so typically the way that this process works is you will be issued a permit regardless of if you can meet it or not. Uh, and if you cannot meet it, there will be a period of time that goes by. You will write your monthly reports and say we violated on X, Y, and Z. And after a certain period of time, three or six months, EPA will say, we're going to give you an administrative order. 
that administrative order through New Hampshire, we've typically been able to negotiate with EPA to say, hey, can you give us 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, whatever it may be that's the appropriate amount of time to research, plan, design, and construct whatever the solution is. So EPA understands that it's not something where you can just, boom, we upgrade and we're at a five milligram per liter plant. They're willing to work with communities. They really just want to make sure that you're working in the right direction. So um, when that time comes, you will be uh, you will be able to negotiate a compliance schedule. Great. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Witham. Thank you. Just wanted to jump on the coattails of Councilor Gibson with about more asphalt, right? So any type of impervious surface, uh, a large industrial plant has a large roof. That water needs to go somewhere just like a parking lot. I, I think city staff and our work with Stratford Regional Planning Commission, we've been very diligent about our stormwater regulations for, for development. Most of it is kept on site. Most of it is treated on site, retention, swales, many of the things that you would find at the stormwater center at UNH. Uh, and we've even done that now with residential subdivisions. Uh, most of them, the stormwater is collected from the street on site uh, and is managed on site and typically by the homeowners association. Uh, that way the city has somewhat rub washed its hands of it. So I think our strategy, uh, at least in terms of development, both residential and commercial, has been mindful of that. Uh, I think as a council, we've embraced uh, the approach of complete streets when we do a major overhaul. You know, underway right now is constitutional way. Uh, I would bet that we have some level of infiltration on that road just because of its age. Uh, this project will take care of a small portion of that, right? So it's going to make it a little bit better. Uh, probably not measurable, but it's every little piece uh, counts. So. I think our efforts, uh, both in terms of regulation and in terms of practice, you know, the, the complete streets are, are helpful to that end goal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions from counselors? All right. Seeing none, I thank you guys so much for being here. I really appreciate it. This is super informative. I think I also want to thank the council for some really phenomenal questions that helped kind of guide the. Uh, thought process behind this. I think we're coming out of today with a much better standing and understanding of um, our next steps. So thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. And if there's any other questions that you'd like us to answer um, or add to this PowerPoint, we're happy to, to supplement it and pass along a, an additional version. All right. Well, with that, we will stand in recess until our normal 7 o'clock meeting. Thanks.